Hello, um, welcome to the Spring Ed Summit. My name is Rob Gross, and uh, our topic for today is aging in MS, which I, is a very important topic to me. I think uh, is frankly is not one that we talk about enough. And I'll begin with a clinical case. Uh, this is a gentleman that I saw recently in the clinic, 62-year-old man who was diagnosed with MS uh, in the early 90s and took a, a disease-modifying therapy beta interferon for a few years, but mostly has been off disease-modifying therapies uh, and has experienced a gradual loss in function of uh, in his legs over the past few years uh, to the point that he's really not hasn't been walking for greater than 10 years and has been in a wheelchair. Uh, also, more recently, has noted some gradual loss of function in his hands uh, to the point that he does need some help getting dressed and cutting, f excuse me, cutting food. Um, but he can uh, mostly transfer uh, by himself to the toilet and, and can shower alone with grab bars. Uh, he wasn't having any trouble swallowing, no urinary or bowel symptoms. Uh, he denied any kind of cognitive problems or recent infections. And, and his main question to me was, you know, what was his MS going to look like in the coming years? So this uh, is from a, a survey from the MS in Focus publication from a couple of years ago, um, where they surveyed a number of older individuals with MS and asked them kind of what, what their big concerns were uh, with aging in MS. And as you can see, there were a variety of different concerns mentioned, uh, including, you know, economic issues. Um, one of the big ones was um, a question of independence or loss of independence, as well as, you know, whether they were going to be able to stay in their homes um, and whether they were going to develop memory issues or have falls. And so it kind of ran the gamut. This is uh, hopefully uh, a slide that many of you have seen in the past that kind of summarizes the changes that we see uh, with multiple sclerosis over time. We know that here in the preclinical phase, meaning before people um, come to medical attention or even before they become symptomatic, um, there might be changes in terms of MRI activity, uh, uh, meaning uh, inflammatory lesions in the nervous system, as well as potentially the beginnings of loss of brain volume. And then for most people, uh, their uh, life with MS begins with a relapse and they develop relapsing remitting disease. Um, and uh, as a reminder, this is kind of the natural flow of the natural um, uh, history of the disease, uh, meaning what would happen if we did nothing like treat with immunotherapies. Uh, so we know that over time, people can accrue disability initially in the relapsing phase. It's in the form of these type of uh, uh, episodes like that we call relapses or exacerbations. And those correspond to um, new or, in, uh, or active lesions on MRIs. And then at, after a certain point, usually 10 or 15 years or more after the onset of the illness, um, some people will transition to the, what's called the secondary progressive phase, uh, in which uh, relapses become fewer, MRI activity becomes rarer, um, but there can still be this gradual accumulation of disability um, and the ever-present uh, loss of brain volume. Um, and um, less is known about the kind of, we, we know that it is, um, uh, there are, it's, it's a neurodegenerative process, but less is known about kind of what drives it. Clearly, um, the loss of brain volume is playing a role. Um, and after a certain point, uh, that loss, um, brain and spinal cord volume contributes to a, uh, uh, a loss of functional reserve, which uh, leads people to just kind of have this uh, gradual accumulation of disability. Just in terms of relapse rates, though, we know this from a variety of different studies. This is a, a, a big one that was done in Canada a few years ago, uh, where they just looked at um, average relapse rates, um, both from disease onset and on the top here, and by uh, the patient's current age. And of course, those two things are related, um, how long it's been since your onset and what your age is. In general, MS does get diagnosed in the first few decades of life, although um, we are seeing people get diagnosed later on in their 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and so, you know, we'll often get the question of, well, well, what does it mean for me if I've been diagnosed later on? Well, that can mean one of two things. One, it could mean 
you've had MS for a long time and it just just never became apparent, in which case um, you are probably uh, more on this side of the of the graph. Um, even though you were diagnosed pretty recently, you, your actual onset was actually many years ago, which can have different implications for things like treatment. Um, and then um, there are, of course, also people that we see where they actually did have onset of the disease in their 50s or in their 60s, um, and, and we treat them probably differently. Corresponding to that um, is uh, these, uh, with each ad advancing decade, we see uh, uh, fewer uh, types of, uh, we see fewer enhancing lesions on, on, on uh, MRIs, which um, uh, indicate active disease. Um, this is just an example of, of what that looks like in somebody's brain. Um, and is when I think when people talk about MS burning out, this is really what they're referring to, that in general, relapses and, and the corresponding uh, MRI activity, they do go down with age, although they don't necessarily disappear completely. And again, this is uh, something that I'll keep referring to uh, is a, this is an average. It doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily um, uh, indicative of what is happening in your particular situation. And so, uh, you know, if you have you know, specific questions about, you know, your age as it results to decisions like treatment. Obviously, I think it's important to talk with your neurologist. This is from a landmark study, um, a pathological study, uh, where they looked at uh, the brains of deceased individuals who had MS, and uh, they looked at the, the composition of their white matter plaques. And they found that in um, people who had had, these generally younger people, who had had uh, the disease for a uh, less amount of time, uh, zero to one years or one to five years, um, that predominantly their brains were filled with these so-called active plaques, active white matter plaques. And that uh, over time, greater than five years, certainly greater than 10 or greater than 20 years, um, those active plaques became less prominent. And in their place, um, there were more inactive plaques or so-called smoldering plaques, which had a kind of an indistinct border. In terms of uh, brain atrophy, I mentioned that this is a process that we think happens from very early on. Uh, this is a very interesting study that looked at um, the whole brain atrophy as well as atrophy in, in specific regions of the brain. Um, and in the upper left here, this is the whole brain atrophy. And you can see that on average, um, the rate of brain atrophy uh, in multiple sclerosis is about 0.4% per year, which is higher than it typically is for people who don't have MS. Um, but that um, you can see that it is divided in between the blue and the green. And the blue it represents the MS specific atrophy which really predominates early on in you know people's 30s and 40s and then over time that ms specific atrophy gives way to a more um, normal aging atrophy which you know unfortunately there's not really much we can do to stop aging um, but presumably there is something that can be done to stop the uh, the MS-related atrophy. But um, that MS-related atrophy is especially notable in certain brain regions like the thalamus, um, which early on um, a significant proportion of the MS-specific atrophy um, uh, is, is, is present. Uh, and then kind of over time, the thalamic atrophy is more a function of, uh, of normal aging. And this is the thalamus here, this structure in green in the center of the brain. Uh, whereas there are other um, regions of the brain that tend to see a kind of a, a constant uh, amount of atrophy um, related to MS over time. So this is a very interesting uh, study to look at the different contributions of normal aging versus, uh, versus MS specific atrophy. I threw in here a slide about life expectancy in MS because it's one that we, a question that we often get. Um, we are certainly seeing people living longer with MS than we'd ever had before. Uh, and perhaps that is related to the fact that we're diagnosing people at younger ages. Um, but perhaps also it's because people are just living longer in general. Um, 
in a study that gets you know cited a lot, uh, a, a Norwegian nationwide cohort study from a couple years ago uh, found that their life expectancy among individuals with MS was approximately 74.7 years uh, compared to 81.8 years in the general population, which was about a seven year difference. Now, what I'll say about that is that one, the life expectancy in the United States is not 81.8 years in general, it's more like 78 years. So the difference between that and 74.7 years is not that pronounced. Um, and also we know that um, the life expectancy is generally, uh, and lower life expectancy is generally driven by um, people who have progressive disease and who are at advanced stages of disability. And so they therefore succumb to certain complications like infections. And so, you know, again, this is an average. This is not necessarily deterministic uh, if, if in any one individual case. Uh, and so we definitely see many people with MS living um, very long, healthy lives otherwise. <laughs> If you look at uh, the different stages of MS from your neurologist's perspective, we generally think of them in three phases. <laughs> One is kind of the beginning, uh, shortly after diagnosis, and at which point we're trying to decide between the different disease-modifying therapies, uh, and then hopefully getting you on the right disease-modifying therapy. And um, after that, hopefully smooth sailing. Um, then for the next 20, 30 years, it's the question of, okay, uh, are things going well? Do we continue the existing treatment? Or uh, are you having a side effect? Is there um, a loss of efficacy of the treatment? In which case you consider uh, treating with a different disease modifying therapy. And then in one's golden years, um, the question now starts to arise, well, what do we do now? We don't think that disease modifying therapy needs to be continued indefinitely. Um, and so this question arises is, you know, should we be just stopping disease modifying therapy and seeing what happens? Um, and that is uh, a topic that is very near and dear to our hearts, especially my colleague, Dr. Corboy, who's uh, started this uh, uh, clinical trial called DISCO MS, uh, in which uh, individuals with stable MS uh, who are older, uh, half of whom are going to stop their disease modifying therapy, the other half is going to continue. And that's going to give us uh, important information about uh, when it's safe and appropriate to, to, to discontinue disease modifying therapies indefinitely. Um, and um, there can be certainly benefits to doing so. Um, and I'll go into that in a second. Uh, first, um, in terms of disease modifying therapies, um, well, in terms of the natural history, I should say, of MS. Um, if you look uh, on the left graph here, this was an older natural history study uh, that just looked at uh, the time that it took to reach an important disability milestone of EDSS of six or moderate disability. Um, and depending on whether somebody had a progressive onset or a relapsing remitting onset. And I, I, I use this to compare to a newer study out of Sweden from a couple of years ago, uh, where they found that with each uh, advancing year of diagnosis, meaning 1994 compared to 1993 or 1995 compared to 1994, um, if you were diagnosed at the later year, uh, each year you had a 6% less likelihood uh, of reaching this important disability milestone of EDSS of four or moderate disability. And so the author speculated that, you know, could it be again we're diagnosing MS earlier, or we're diagnosing more MS, in which case more people have uh, what turned out to be a benign form, um, possibly, although it's most likely also the case that um, as, you know, in the modern era, we're more likely to treat people with uh, immunotherapies, especially more effective immunotherapies at earlier time points. And so we strongly think that that is uh, what is contributing to these better outcomes, you know, later on. And to remind people um, about the different immunotherapy trials that led to approval of the different agents that we use, um, 
this slide is really just to, to show people that in general the studies that led to those approvals uh, included mostly younger individuals. On the left you have the relapsing studies uh, where the median or average age was really in the 30s for the most part and the maximal age was 50 or 55. And then on the right here you have the progressive studies where the average age was usually in the 40s and the maximal age was 60 or 65. And so, you know, what does that mean for people who are older than that, um, I think is a very good question. And, you know, we have to kind of extrapolate um, in, in many instances and, and, and in other instances, we just really don't have clear data uh, that, that uh, shows that um, these treatments are actually beneficial. Um, this is a study that um, gets cited a lot that I think people also kind of misinterpret uh, where um, uh, some researchers looked at many MS uh, drug trials, uh, 38 I believe, and they kind of combined them all together uh, and did a kind of a joint analysis called a meta-analysis in which they looked at over 28,000 individuals with MS uh, treated with these various disease modifying therapies. And they found that uh, age really was a strong determinant of whether somebody was responsive to immunotherapy or not. Excuse me. And that the average age of 53, um, after that, uh, on average, people did not seem to benefit from immunotherapy in terms of delayed disability. So again, there's that word average. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that just because you're 55, you're not going to respond to immunotherapy, but um, that those will that will depend on your individual circumstances, including uh, how recently you were diagnosed and uh, how recently it was that you had overt signs of uh, inflammation. We know though that there are risks for uh, for these different immunotherapies uh, that increase with uh, with age, uh, and some things uh, like. Um, medical conditions diabetes high blood pressure heart disease, we know happen increasingly as people get older. And some of those things can also be side effects of our treatments or can be um, things that put uh, use of our treatments uh, at, at, in, a, in a higher risk category. So for instance, uh, if you have diabetes, uh, you could potentially um, develop something called macular edema or swelling in the back of the eye. That is also a uh, a rare side effect of one of uh, our treatments called Jeleni or Fingolimod. And, um, and so in general, we try to avoid uh, using, using that disease modifying therapy in people who have diabetes. Um, and, you know, also we see uh, as people get older, an increased risk for infections, uh, as our immune systems start to weaken. And there are conditions like this first one, PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which, you know, is a rare brain infection that really we see most often in the, in the case of using, using immunotherapies. Um, uh, and, uh, but then there are also these other infections like shingles or urinary tract infections that we see just commonly in the general population, but that are uh, we, we see, especially in people uh, with MS who, who are older and who have higher levels of disability, and especially those individuals who are also being treated with systemic immunosuppressants. And so um, that is one potential reason that we, we like to consider stopping uh, treatment as people get older is because we don't want the treatment to be uh, causing damage and first do no harm. And then uh, there's the cost uh, of these drugs. Of course, everybody knows that these immunotherapies are extraordinarily expensive. Um, so it's cost, not just in terms of your, you know, deductible or your, your copay, um, but also in terms of opportunity costs, maybe the time that you spend, um, you know, driving to an infusion site or the time you spend you know, on the phone arguing with an insurance agent. Um, and then there's cost to the, to the healthcare system as well. Um, there's, easily over 100,000 people uh, over, uh, over age 55 in this country with uh, multiple sclerosis. And um, if you know a significant percentage of them don't really need to be using immunotherapies anymore, then perhaps uh, those the savings from that could go to some uh, something that would be more fruitful and that we're talking about maybe something in the billions of dollars. <laughs> 
So as your individual neurologists and healthcare providers, um, we think of the, uh, the benefits of immunotherapies uh, as beginning at the beginning stages of the disease as being very important, uh, the benefits being very high, and then kind of gradually dwindling with time. And then the risks as kind of uh, gradually going up with time. And then there's a certain point at which the risks outweigh the benefits, although we're still trying to figure out exactly when that time is, and it likely varies depending on the person. Um, and so that is part of what that that trial DISCO MS is trying to figure out. Um, and then let me switch gears for a second and talk about remyelination and repair. Uh, we know that myelination and remyelination in the central nervous system uh, happens because of a certain type of cell called oligodendrocyte. Uh, myelin is, uh, of course, important both for helping the nerves transmit their impulses to each other uh, in, a, in an efficient way, uh, something called saltatory conduction. But it also is important just for keeping the, the nerve alive and keeping the axon healthy. Um, uh, ligodendrocyte precursor cells are um, the cells that live in the nervous system that um, will basically, they're the stem cells, they're the ones that become the oligodendrocytes um, that can then produce myelin. And what we know is that with age, those OPCs uh, function less well, meaning they don't readily differentiate into those myelin producing oligodendrocytes. And some of that has to do with the fact that these other types of cells like macrophages and microglia um, also don't operate as well and they're not they're not removing as much of the cellular debris and they're and they're releasing fewer promyelinating factors um, but regardless of the the cause the, as the result is that these opcs don't uh, become uh, oligodendrocytes as much and they don't produce as much myelin as people get older this is a, a cartoon um, that is supposed to represent a process called um, uh, heterochronic parabiosis, which is uh, a type of experiment in which, in this case, uh, an old mouse is sewn to a younger mouse, and so their physiologies are, are shared. Uh, and in, in a, a particular recent experiment, they did this and they looked at uh, OPC function and they found that um, the young mouse transmitted uh, certain factors, um, including uh, a type of immune cell called monocytes that kind of help to rejuvenate uh, the older mouse's uh, uh, OPCs and, and their ability to, to differentiate into functional oligodendrocytes that produce myelin. So um, how does that translate into humans? I don't think we're going to be seeing uh, human beings sewn to each other anytime in the near future, um, but hopefully we'll be able to identify those factors that, that are really responsible for, you know, inhibiting this process and, and then maybe we can target those specific uh, factors. We know that as people get older, uh, there are a variety of things that happen just throughout the body. Uh, their skin becomes drier, bones become more brittle, um, and that is especially the case with people who've had long-standing MS that's been treated with things like corticosteroids. Um, we know our metabolism slows and we just kind of get weaker. We lose our muscle strength. Uh, our heart's uh, pumping ability and our lung capacity both can decrease. Our appetite can decrease and constipation does become more common as people get older. We know that um, bladder control uh, weakens and then in men, um, prostate dysfunction can also lead to trouble with urination. Hearing and vision can decrease and then also short term memory uh, and other cognitive things can slow down. And so some of these, you look at this list and you say, well, well, that sounds like, you know, something that can also happen in MS. And one of the common questions that I get is, well, is this symptom my MS or is this just me getting older? To which I'll often answer, yes, <laughs> it is one of those things or potentially both of those things. Um, certainly in the case of, you know, cognitive dysfunction that it, both could be playing a prominent role, but, you know, also as people get older, um, there's the possibility that you could develop an additional condition, you know, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of, uh, of dementia, and it happens in roughly 10% of people over age 65. It's not that MS makes that more likely, but uh, it is common enough that it is a, a, significant percentage of our people who get older with MS are also going to develop uh, that. 
Um, and so if, if, if cognitive dysfunction becomes very prominent, that's something that we uh, tend to think about. And then there are other symptoms that um, could very well be MS related. Um, I'm thinking of mood disorders and you know things like depression that are you know extraordinarily common in uh, individuals with MS, um, but that we don't necessarily treat any differently from the way they're commonly treated by mental health professionals, meaning with medications or psychotherapy. Uh, our toolkit is pretty much the same. And so, uh, you know, the question is, you know, does it really matter if it's, you know, related to MS or not? We're basically going to treat it the same way. I wanted to throw in a slide about menopause in MS, as it does relate to aging in MS. Um, and uh, a question has come up about trying to distinguish between an MS relapse and menopause, because, you know, of course, um, you can see fatigue, bladder problems, difficulty concentrating, or depressed mood in both of those conditions. And sometimes it legitimately can be um, difficult to distinguish those things. But again, you know, if you're if you're concerned about your particular situation and you you have you're having new symptoms like this, that's important to discuss it with your with your uh, healthcare provider, your neurologist. Excuse me. There have been studies. Um, smaller studies that um, have looked at uh, the changes uh, in menopause as they relate to MS symptoms. Uh, and uh, some of them uh, have seemed to indicate that uh, they might worsen some pre-existing MS symptoms, like namely fatigue um, uh, or cognition. But um, uh, then, you know, the question came up, well, um, what about hormone replacement therapy? Will that, will that actually improve things? And there, the studies have been somewhat ambiguous, and um, the, there have been various trials with um, forms of estrogen in MS, but not all of them have been in, in uh, perimenopausal or postmenopausal women. Uh, and so it's not clear what, what kind of conclusions you can draw from that. In general, I'd, I'm not a strong proponent for hormone replacement therapy unless um, you know, a patient comes to me and says their primary doc or their GYN suit is suggesting it, in which case I have no problem with it. Um, I just don't know that it's necessarily going to uh, change the course of, of somebody's MS, but it may help with their individual symptoms. Uh, and then we know that from some other studies that MS relapses do tend to go down after menopause, although, you know, as I discussed earlier on in the natural history of MS, as people get older, relapses do tend to decline. And so whether that's a function of the changing of the hormonal environment in menopause or 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 if it's just the related to aging it's not i think it's not particularly clear but it's not all bad news with age um, we know that uh, some things do get better <laughs> like a fine wine um, we know that as again there are fewer relapses in ms um, and then there's this question of you know maybe not needing to take these immunotherapies you know whether they're injections or pills or, or infusions. Uh, and so that can free people up uh, in a lot of ways. Um, as people get older, they do have kind of more life experience and, and people who age successfully with MS, they generally, um, they kind of get to know their bodies very well and, and they don't get as kind of bothered by uh, things that they, they, they're kind of better able to predict, you know, what's going to happen. And, and they kind of just settle into the condition more, certainly more than some of my younger patients with, with MS. There, we now have more resources for people as they get older with MS um, that aren't specifically, you know, related to medications that we might prescribe. So things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, palliative care, which is a, a relatively new medical discipline, uh, and senior care. And there are also these um, other things like aging life care professionals and area agencies on aging that can, you know, connect people with, uh, with additional resources uh, for older individuals. Um, and so, um, and finally, there is a, a now a greater focus on older and progressive patients in clinical trials. It's still, I don't think, where where I'd like to see it. Um, but certainly, compared to that that earlier slide that I showed about all the the different drug trials in MS and the average ages, I think we're we're working towards understanding that people are getting older with MS, and we need to develop. Um, more uh, and better interventions for older individuals with with MS through clinical trials, and so we're we're getting there. Um, so be patient with us. Um, and uh, I think that's my last slide. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I encourage you to to listen to all the other excellent uh, presentations today.